Hi, welcome to another episode of History in 7 Fact. In this show, we'll explore some of the most interesting things that we know or not know about our own past. In this chapter, we're going to discover some of the lost ancient worlds to see if we can find some interesting facts you may not know. Today we'll talk about the superstars of ancient Rome, gladiators. We all know them and we all love them, but just how much of what Hollywood has shown us is actually real? Stick around to find out. Gladiators. We've heard the stories, we've seen the movies and we've read the books. We're all fascinated by the lives of these unknown heroes that were forced to battle each other for the entertainment of others. But they weren't all victims of a miserable practice, but rather showmen, professional artists. First, let's settle the name. The word gladiator simply means swordsman, from the Latin word for sword, gladius. In the social hierarchy of the time, gladiators belonged to the lowest classes, similar to slaves, but most of them weren't treated badly. On the contrary, many became stars of their time and were treated as such, some even having their own fan clubs. That's right, contrary to popular belief, the terrifying battles to the death in which slaves were forced to fight, kill or be killed were not exactly that common. Even the famous phrase, we who are about to die salute you, cannot be found in ancient Roman recordings. Gladiator fights weren't a bloodbath, but rather carefully prepared shows, supervised by a referee. Sure, there was always the risk of death, and many surely died during the countless fights, but most actually survived. The risk of injury and death were part of the show, just like in today's extreme and violent sports. And that's just it. People love danger, and they are willing to pay for it. The skills, courage and brute force of the gladiators transformed them into ancient superstars, and the ladies loved them. There are countless texts that mention how women of all ages and classes were longing for the love of these brave men. The first images of gladiators fighting date back to the 4th century BC, and you can tell it was a popular show just by counting the venues. 186 amphitheaters used for gladiator fights popped up throughout the entire empire by the 1st century AD. The remains of gladiators clearly showed that their lives sometimes ended in a violent way. Often, you'll find crushed bones, skulls with several holes in them, throat cuts so deep that they left marks on the bones. However, in most cases you'll find that the quality of medical treatments for these gladiators was top-notch. Most broken bones were mended so well that you can hardly see any traces of the trauma, indicating a very well-tended injury followed by physical therapy. Written accounts also tell of personal doctors and massagers in some cases. In all likelihood, gladiators received top medical care, nutritious food and lots of attention, setting them way above the actual slaves of the time. Now you may wonder why these gladiators were so well taken care of. The answer is money. The big guys of the gladiator business, the Laniste, sought to protect their fighters both in the arena and outside. For them, these people were investment. Training a man to be an able fighter takes a lot of time and money. And if they performed in the arena, that meant lots and lots of profits. So letting them die was simply bad for business. And so, those who organized the gladiator fight paid extra care and made sure the referees knew which gladiators were allowed to be killed and which were off limits. Veterans were usually allowed to leave the arena alive, even if they were defeated. What may surprise you is that neither the public nor the officials or even the emperors decided who lives or who dies. 
The reason is quite simple. The Lannister spent large amounts of money on each gladiator, so their financial gains were more important. And as I said, it took a lot of money to train a gladiator. The Lannister had well-established schools in which the disciples had to follow a very strict regime of training and discipline. Their diets were rich in carbohydrates, so to have enough energy and gain enough weight. Any injury was treated by trained doctors. All these things were continuously ongoing, so you had to spend a lot of money. Interfering in the arena and letting the wrong gladiator die would upset all the Lannister, who would then take their men elsewhere to protect their assets. The Lannister had a lot of power in the arena. He could influence the referee to spare certain fighters and even stop the game, if a valuable gladiator was in a dire situation. The referee, however, had to take into account the public's reaction, so it was all a well-coordinated, albeit bloody, show. The fights had no allotted time. They could go on for a long time, in which case the referee could pause the games or even stop them to avoid boredom. But the gladiators could also simply give up by dropping their shields or swords or, if they were on the ground, by raising their hand. If a fight was really good, the crowd would shout out their wishes, yelling mercy or slit his throat. In such tense moments, a decision had to be made fast, because for each killed gladiator, the organizer had to compensate the Lannister. According to the accounts of the time, less than 10% of the gladiators who would fight in a game actually died. The sponsors of the game, the aristocrats, also sought to protect gladiators, at least the best and most renowned. Julius Caesar himself used to decree to save any famous gladiator during the games. Even Rome's most crazy and bloodthirsty emperor, Nero, also gave similar orders. So gladiators, while considered low-class citizens, equivalent to slaves, were at the same time a protected class. Even more, the winners were usually congratulated by the aristocrats and were given sums of money, which they could actually keep, even if they were basically slaves. Since most gladiators were low-class people, slaves or criminals, these gifts were extremely valuable to them. Amazingly, some gladiators were free men who volunteered to be gladiators. They were called auctorati, and some of them were just looking for the fame, although most were just seeking to earn some money. Now, when we think of gladiators, images of Russell Crowe pop into our heads, right? So how much of what we see in that movie is real? Well, the financial interests of the games are as close to reality as they can be. And while group fights like the ones we see in the movie were not that common, their individual fighting styles are probably similar to the real things. You can also spot the Haranari, the assistants that would use long sticks or whips to discipline or push the gladiators into the fight. Oh, and when the public was asking for someone's death, they weren't sticking their thumbs downwards, but upwards. So it's exactly the other way around. Lastly, let's talk about how these games took place in ancient times. Typically, the day would start with an animal show, such as a hunt in the arena. In many cases, exotic animals like lions were indeed used. By lunch, it was time for the executions. Condemned criminals were brought into the arena and publicly executed by various and gruesome means, like crucifixions or, yes, even ripped apart by animals. Once the executions were over, it was time for some artistic moments. These included dances, theatric acts or comedic bits. It was in the afternoon that gladiators would show themselves in the sounds of drums and trumpets. Each gladiator's detailed past experiences, especially their victories, were publicly displayed even before the show, so to know who you were rooting for. 
Then the gladiators in their lavishly decorated armors would warm up in front of the public using wooden weapons. Each gladiator was probably showing off, executing some cool moves, which were applauded and savored by the public, just like in today's events. Then the fights would start. The referee had the power to stop a game or pause it if the rules were broken or if one of the fighters was about to die. Each day 12 to 15 fights would occur and the games would go on for days or even weeks. It was a macabre spectacle but only because death did occur and it was allowed. In all other aspects, these games and the public's reactions were not at all that different from what we enjoy today, over 2000 years later. Thank you for watching this episode of 7 Facts. I hope this was interesting and informative and maybe it even inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked this video, please thumbs up and subscribe. While you're downstairs, let me know what you think about this video. Please consider visiting my Patreon page and become a Patron. The link is in the description. I hope to see you next time. Bye.